everyone. Welcome to week six, games and assessment. So today what we have is we have a very special guest, and her name is Dr. Monica Geist. And um, she is from Front Range Community College, where she is the assessment specialist, math faculty, and I believe these days she's also um, she's also holding the title of Westminster Campus um, Faculty Senate President. So, what she's going to be talking to um, us today about is going to be games and assessment. So we're going to go ahead and let her get started now. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Monica, and Kay did a great job introducing me, so I'm not going to say any more. Um, and but I do want to just say this: that I'm really a dinosaur when it comes to technology. So when Kay asked me to do this, I was pretty nervous, and she said to hold my hand and walk walk me through this. So this presentation is actually going to be uh, part uh, the traditional way that we do things and then it's going to be kind of open to you all to, to think about how we can do this in using games. So it's going to be, so what I'm going to do is when we when we uh, start in on this PowerPoint presentation, I'll be explaining things that I might be explaining to say a group of teachers who teach in the classroom in traditional ways. So that will be the challenge is, okay, how can we do what we used to do, but now using um, games as our teaching methods. Okay, so let's get started um, uh, with this PowerPoint that I'm calling Games and Assessment. And the first thing that you want to do is start by um, asking the right questions. And so basically this slide here is talking about um, effective systematic inquiry processes begin with an appropriate question and and really the question that you go ask about about learning or anything you're trying to assess is probably the most important thing about what you're doing because if you don't ask the right question you're not going to get the right information and there are several types of questions, and we're going to go through several of them. However, there might be more that I didn't cover in this list. And so this week in the MOOC, when we're discussing things, maybe you could even add different types of questions that you thought of. All right, so this first type of question is called learning outcomes related question. So learning outcomes are those things that usually start out with the phrase student will be able to. They are specific um, things that the student will be able to do. They're measurable, which means you can somehow observe them. Um, they're time bound, which means, um, it, and that time bound is usually something like by the end of the course, the student will be able to, or something like that. Um, but those are called learning outcomes. And there's lots of websites out there. If you just Google learning outcomes, uh, a whole bunch of teacher websites on how to, to write those. But here's an example. After unit three, so that's the time bound part, students will be able to list the four fun keys to create important emotions. And I actually got that from our MOOC because in unit three there was uh, an article about the four keys to creating Im important um, emotions and the answers to that are here on the next slide. Oh, okay, that was my example. Let's go one more slide then. Um, okay, there's the answer. So um, you get the idea. With the student learning outcome, the, the teacher will say the very specific thing the student's supposed to learn. In this particular one, um, this would be the question from our MOOC, and then we'll go to the next slide to get the second part. And here are those fun things. Um, there's hard fun, easy fun, serious fun, and people fun. But uh, you'll know that if you were reading that one article in Unit 3. So that's an example of a, of a student learning outcome. It's the most basic kind of assessment that we do as teachers. 
we say, here's what I want my student to know, and, um, and you write it as a learning outcome. So in traditional methods for how we collect that kind of data, we would either give an exam um, or a quiz, whether it was online or in class, or we might have some sort of a grading rubric if somebody's supposed to have a uh, write a paper or a short answer or something like that. So we are talking about these learning outcomes that start with student will be able to, and it's things like write, identify, list. It's something that's observable. And our normal way to assess those is a paper, an exam, a quiz. And now my question to you is, how could you collect this information using games or other non-traditional methods? Okay, so I'm I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to I'm going to take over Mike real quick. Um, the first thing I have to say, and this is Kay, when you were go when you had this, and Chris, if you could pull the slide up on the four fun key factors <laughs> for important emotion. You know, when when I when I saw this, I, I thought immediately of the traditional methods that the traditional methods that you were talking about. You know, like you had there an exam or a quiz or or some or something kind of written paper. But you know the thing about it is if you were looking for these four key things that were showing up in a game, I started to think about it is you wouldn't I wouldn't be looking for a student to multiple choice this or you know like what's hard fun, Fiero, or to list these things. What what I would really like is I could see a couple different things. One, I could see a student having to take a screenshot of each of these things. Mm. So the hard fun or the fiero, take a, a screenshot for me of when this is happening. That easy fun or curiosity, what part of the game does that? Um, what part of this is serious fun? What part of this is, is people fun? But you know, since, since our students in the MOOC are, are actually, um, you know, teachers, I, I, th I think if, we, if we're, we're devising that, if we were talking a little bit about devising a badge on, on game-based learning, if I was to assess that and wanted to make sure that they knew these things, I wouldn't multiple choice it. I think I'd screenshot and then they'd have to ex explain that screenshot. And if I, and if I was going to really, really push it, um, I, I would consider either, even having them screen share these things and do a narration of it. Uh oh, <laughs> I might have stolen somebody else's Fiero by making that statement. So, <laughs> no, I really but, like that. I like that idea a lot. But and and the other thing I was going to pull up because this was the example I had ready <laughs> okay. before I heard you talk. Okay, the example that I had ready, and I'm going to say really quick. It, this is a game that we did play in in the games the first week. It was one of the games for change that we were testing out, and it's called um, Doffer is Dying. And it's a very, very serious subject. And, and myself and Cherry Emerson, um, we were in her classroom, her anthropology class or sociology. She actually did it in three classes, where, where they got to see the video, The Devil on Horseback, which was about the same, the same crisis. And they also got to play the game. Well, I, I'll tell you the difference with the students, it, with the game. Um, the, it was definitely much more of an emphasis on, on the water and the problem of going out there and getting caught and things like that. And, and when you have a learning outcome there, I know in the comparison with the movie, um, with the movie versus the, the game on trying to get that across, the, the frustration <laughs> that came with the game um, did actually seem to emphasize the water and also the aspect about you, you Cindy, that in these kind of cases, actual children were sent were more likely to be sent out than adults. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you say about the, the how do you collect this this infor, this information, um, I'm I'm thinking that with a game you could do it in a lot of different ways that that just isn't text based. And I'm going to get off mic because I know because I know Chris is is over here chomping at the bit too. <laughs> to talk about it a bit. <laughs> yes. Uh, so one of the things I look at is uh, you know with learning objectives and looking at how 
are we assessing and how are you making sure that we're looking at this particular part is in most games what you'll see is quests. And so what do you mean by quests is this is how the game moves the individuals through the content. So so basically in D2L, think of it as a, or in any LMS, think of it as your content page where you're putting all the all the work on there that you're breaking out for each week. So what happens in World of Warcraft is we put an exclamation point over everybody. And then you have a quest here. And they try to make the quest fun. Uh, it is something that's considered a, a very long drawn out process uh, throughout the game because in, in the game, in most games you're doing what's called uh, grinding, which is basically you're leveling from one, a, a level zero character all the way to the highest level character. And so uh, one of the ways to sort of know what's going on and, and seeing um, what students are, are accomplishing is number one, the instructor has to know the quests. Uh, so a lot of people who are using uh, these games, what they're doing is they're picking specific quests in the game for the students to complete. Uh, and these are quests that have been vetted by the instructor. So uh, one of the things you'll probably hear a lot in my examples will be all about the instructor has to know the game uh, before they can put the students into the game. Uh, so that's definitely something that the, that's going to help you Number one, figure out how to collect the information and to, um, what sort of methods are going to apply uh, to your gaming madness. So the other thing is, is like I said, you're going to see these quests. Uh, when, you, when you finish a quest, the exclamation point over the guy who you turn it into will turn into a question mark. Uh, and you go ahead and you get an award for doing that. So different types of awards are typically gear because again the game most games are about player improvement uh, personal improvement you're doing things to make your character stronger uh, more resilient things like that so really uh, I totally agree with Kay as far as collection methods looking at screenshots non-text you could have them write reflection papers that's fine uh, we've we've also uh, uh, had some uh, there's been also some other instructors out there who've gone ahead and had students, um, especially in creative writing, writing backstories for certain characters uh, that are out there that the player runs into. So that's another uh, area you could do is have them talk about a day in the life of uh, or create backstory for a specific uh, character. Uh, I would also encourage uh, screen sh uh, basically screen sharing, screenshots, uh, recording the screen. There's a, there's a ton of content on... YouTube, they've made it very easy now to collect video, and students don't have to show their faces. They can record the screen, and you don't have to worry about it as long as they're not necessarily using their real name as their as their actual you know uh, Google account or YouTube account uh, that they're going ahead and talking on. So there's lots of different ways to collect information. Most of them are going to be visual, especially in a game. Uh, Kate, you know, we talked about Fiero and Hard Fun. Uh, this is this is very easy to document in in games. There's a lot of uh, excellent resources out there already that you can go ahead and check out. Uh, just simply pick a game of choice, type in, uh, type that name of the game into YouTube, and you'll see tons of user-generated content uh, available for people to read and people to do and people to look at. Uh, as you're evaluating this type of methodology. So I'll turn it back to Micah. Well, thank you, Chris and Kay. You guys are brilliant. What I was thinking about while you were talking is um, there's these two things that I probably should have talked about from the beginning. It's these two ideas. One is called formative assessment and one is summative assessment. Formative assessment is what you do while you're still with the students um, helping form their learning and you are forming your class and you can make adjustments. And so an example would be if you're in a traditional classroom, you ask the class a question over the reading that they had from last night and nobody answers. And so quickly in your mind, you're going, oh no, they either didn't read or they didn't understand the question or they didn't understand the reading. So now you've got to adjust a little bit. And we all do that as, as classroom teachers. Well, um, that formative assessment does not necessarily go in the grade book. Formative assessment can be ungraded quizzes, anonymous quizzes, but it's basically the kind of assessment that gives the teacher feedback on adjusting what he or she is doing in the classroom, but it's not hurting the student's grade necessarily. Summative assessment is more when the judgment part comes in. 
it's like a final exam. It's like a chapter exam. It's when the teacher says, all right, this is how much you learned, and I'm putting a grade in the grade book. So what I see that Chris and Kay were talking about, a lot of that could be, could be formative. And I really like that idea to say, here's a concept. Um, go write a backstory that shows me that you understand this concept. Or go take a screenshot to show me you know what Fierro is. And so I like that idea. And, and Chris said you can have, I think he said, you can have no names or names. But I like that idea because then the teacher can adjust right there, maybe, in the game and make it very formative and then um, later have some sort of summative activity as well. So did you two want to talk about formative and summative at all? Um, I, I think especially, this is Kay, um, I, yeah, <laughs> it's not Monica's voice, so it's Kay's voice. Okay. <laughs> So um, I think I think when it comes to for, formative assessment, I, I do go back to and, and yes, Monica guys has taught me all about the classroom assessment technique. So those short those short little quizzes that you give in class, and and I think that you can do that when it com when it comes to games, and I think you can adapt readily. Now, not all of your students are necessarily going to be gamers, so I think that that's especially appropriate. One, to find out whether they're having any technology problems. And the second one is, is to make sure they're not getting, that they're not really going off on a tangent when, when you're in game. And, and that, that's something that I think you, you have to keep bringing back students to if you're going to be using a games if, for an extended period. That this, this, that a short little formative assessment along the way can in, m m make you, <laughs> can, it's the way that you can make certain that they're keeping on track mm -hmm. and, that they're, and that they're engaging with the material rather than just, than just pattern recognition. And, and, that, and that's something that, that we can talk about a bit more later, but and with games or, or even homework managers, there's always the, there's always the chance that, that it's more about pattern recognition than actually learning the material. And because of that, I think a formative assessment can make certain that the material and the content's being learned. Exactly. I like that, Kay. And also, before we leave this topic of learning outcome, which I think is the most important type of outcome we have as teachers, um, I, just from kind of processing what you two are saying, I think we can have much more complicated learning outcomes when we're using games. I might be wrong about that. But um, I, I can see a, in a regular classroom, I could see a learning outcome being something like explain photosynthesis. Okay, so that's a complicated process, but the learning outcome itself could be explain. Whereas I can see with a game, you could say um, demonstrate that you understand this 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 difficult concept or this complicated concept. So explaining it or writing out the steps on paper maybe is one thing. But then having to demonstrate, maybe pulling up a game or, or making a video or whatever, I feel like you, you get to be more, uh, maybe you get more depth. I'm not sure. What do you guys think? I think you do. I mean, one of the things that uh, you'll see in, in large games like World of Warcraft and some others is that there's also a visual representation of complexity. Uh, for instance, in, in World of Warcraft, there is, uh, you know, if you click on a monster, you get a portrait of the monster. And what they've done is they've, they've gone ahead and said, well, this is a more complex uh, problem you have to solve or, or, or a, a monster you have to kill is basically they put a, a silver dragon and a gold dragon around them. A silver dragon around the portrait means it's slightly harder than your normal uh, normal monster and then basically the there's a gold dragon which means it's it's an elite a very difficult monster that you really can't tackle yourself you have to collaborate with other players to do it now most games have some sort of visual component to it to let the user know hey this one is more complex than what you're used to 
Um, games also do a really good job of scaffolding the player and moving them forward. It's very obvious when you're in the wrong area uh, or you're lacking in skill set uh, fundamental because uh, with most games you expire very quickly, uh, so you have to <laughs> die in court. So I mean, I mean, really, there is that visual component of complexity um, that 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 players can can key off of, and and as instructors, that's something we might want to think about um, coming in and giving that indication to our students is when we get into a slightly harder problem or a a you know sort of a keystone problem for a specific area, we might want to assign some sort of visual representation to it to let the students know, aha, this is not just your average question or this is not just your average exam. This is something that is is a little bit different. It's going to take a little bit more time and uh, you need to pay attention to it. And take a little bit more thought. And that's what it's all about, right? Yes, and I was going to say a quick comment. I have it up on the screen, um, but Beverly MacArthur, she was our um, she was our speaker for week four when we did epistemic games, mm -hmm. and she's absolutely fabulous. Um, also, on the materials for this week, um, I put it up under under the videos, and, and she was on a recent panel that that we were broadcasting, and we have her down there for. She has a 13-minute section on wicked problems and complex systems. And what um, Beverly actually does is uh, she is a, a simulation designer and a defense contractor. And what she talks about is, is actually how, how the military looks at games and simulations for critical thinking, wicked problems, complex systems, and things that, that aren't easy and obvious. And, and and when you said about photosynthesis being a, a you know a complex problem, exactly. Think about if the students not only had to know that, but were also being asked to to solve some kind of problem that that, that dealt with um, world hunger at the same time. That that's usually what games give you. It's it's usually not just the one thing, but it's multiple things to look at. I like that. You guys are making me think I should start using games. <laughs> okay, let's go on to the next type of question, which is called process evaluation types of questions. And basically, um, process evaluation is uh, related to your processes. So if you're in a school and you're in a regular school building, um, a process evaluation you might have first is um, how, how well is our registration process set up? Are students frustrated with getting registered and signing up for classes? Um, it's basically how do we do things? How do things work? Uh, could we make them work better? Do we have stupid policies that make it really difficult for our students to do what they need to do? And so a lot of process evaluation questions that have to do with administrative things or things that we may be set up and maybe they're not so much classroom based however a process evaluation question could be classroom based it could be do what what policies do I have in the class are helping or hurting my students success and so I've got some questions here on this slide and then um, on the next one, if you look at the next one as well, and some of these questions are, are about processes. Um, the ones I thought maybe were related to games would be, how well did students understand our process? That actually could be related to the game. Uh, were the directions of the game clear? Was the directions of the challenge clear? Um, another thing I thought of was maybe that are faculty and instructors sufficiently trained to be able to um, teach with with a game or whatever? So, a training of the faculty would be something more administrative. So that would kind of fall under this set of questions called process evaluation. Now, the traditional ways before we talk about non-traditional ways um, to ask about processes would be follow-up surveys. Um, so it's you go to a restaurant, your server gives you this ticket and then he says, 
hey, could you fill out this survey in the next couple of days? That's a follow-up survey. What was our process? How did we do? There's also, oh, I'm going to have you go to the next slide. Sorry about that. There's another kind of um, follow-up called a point of service interview. And that's where you catch the student or the person right after they have, say, gone through the registration process or gone through the financial aid line. And, um, or in this instant, you could catch a student right after they create an account on the game site. And they go, okay, what was that like for you? Did it make sense? Did, were the directions clear? What could have been more clear? So that's called a point of service interview. And then there's my favorite, which is the whole secret shopper thing, where you basically have a third party who's neutral, who, who goes through the process and gives you feedback. Um, and they're called secret shoppers. There's actually companies who, who have these people go around and secret shop all sorts of um, stores and places who, who provide service. Okay, those are traditional ways that we would evaluate processes. So, go on to the next slide. How could you collect this information using games or other non-traditional methods? Okay. Um, what's interesting about looking at um, process evaluation in games is what most games do is they have meta sites uh, or metadata sites that's out there. These are fan sites. These are uh, could be company sponsored sites uh, where players come onto a forum and they discuss gameplay and they discuss what's going on. So very similar to your, uh, I know most instructors probably have like a a coffee shop or a class mixer area in their in their class, uh, at least those that are teaching online, in face-to-face -face you might have them doing group discussions uh, talking about their experiences. Uh, in games, as far as looking at uh, process, what you mostly will see, uh, if you click on my, my screen, is you'll see some sort of progress bar uh, that are there. Again, like I said, games are very visual, um, and what they're doing is you're just trying to get to the end of that bar. And you do that over and over and over again. So, I mean, the the process as a player, you see that immediate feedback because as you complete a quest, uh, you will will see that little meter move forward. So uh, there's a high satisfaction with a lot of players because they're seeing that immediate. They go ahead, they do a, they do a job, a quest, a chore, and they get points for that, and it moves them up their level. And so you have these little progression bars that you see. So from a player standpoint or a student standpoint, having this visual representation of my progress is something that, that very, it definitely makes them uh, feel feel probably more satisfied with the game, but also looking at um, allowing them to see their progress. But for most companies, gaming companies, what they're using is they're using these player sites, these fan sites, their own official uh, forum boards, and they're looking at traffic, they're looking at complaints, uh, they're seeing, you know, where are the issues, what are the flaws that, that the students are pointing out. So most of it is just giving them, uh, most games just give the players a opportunity to, to you know, for lack of a better word, vent uh, about what's going on in the game. Uh, you also have a lot of player help sites out there in these fan sites which says, oh, hey, this is a really difficult quest. You know, go ahead and do this. And an example I had earlier uh, was this website right here called Wowhead. And what Wowhead is for Game of World of Warcraft uh, yeah, I'm going to be very World of Warcraft focused because that's something I'm using in my classes right now. Uh, basically, it's a compilation of all the quests in the game by users. These are people who use their own time to type all this stuff in. And then at the bottom, they have comments that where players share strategies on how to actually go ahead and, and finish these quests. So you have this collaborative effort of, of group resolution of any problem. And so that's sort of the method that most games are using to collect data is the, are these forum boards, having a discussion board up, having a place where users can interact with one another and they can say, hey, I'm having this problem. Is anyone else having this problem? And they can commiserate and they can post it. And then the game can come back in and they can post saying, hey, we resolved this issue as of this patch or as of this, you know, now, now you can do this. Um, so a lot of uh, a lot of gaming companies are now using these forum boards as sort of this unofficial market research and a way where to improve their games. 
Thank you, Chris. Um, here's what I was thinking when you were explaining. See, I'm learning all this about these games now. Um, I, I, okay, so in the first uh, section we were talking about learning outcomes, and I think we, we decided that games you could, uh, you could assess deeper, more complicated learning outcomes. Well, here, on you know, this se section, I'm thinking, Games have the advantage again because these comments that you're talking about, all this this feedback on the processes, and then the people who are creating the game can actually read it and then change things. Or like you were talking about the group resolution of problems, like maybe there's nothing wrong with the game. It's just that um, it's there's something challenging, and then the group has to come together to help. Uh, figure out the solution in the game. I feel like again, games are have the advantage because you've got these these comments. They're right up there for everyone to see, including the people who put it on the game. And it helps collaboration. I mean, it helps people learn. I'm very impressed. <laughs> okay. What I was going to say is, I take a slightly different view of this. Okay, because the area I teach is marketing. And so process evaluation is, is something that, that is part of the content area. Um, so what I, when I really look at games, and I'm pulling this game up because um, I also, uh, it, within marketing, I teach agribusiness marketing and food marketing. And this is a very controversial game. It's called the McDonald video game. And, and the thing about it is it, what it really does is it shows one point of view. It doesn't show multiple points of view. It shows di it shows the viewpoint that's coming from a very much an organic consumer or an organic consumer or an organic um, group. And the thi and the thing and the thing about that that's really cool with the McDonald game is that you can actually have the students play the game. And look at not it in two ways. And the McDonald game is all about how how you raise cattle, <laughs> and then and then and then the cattle goes to being made into hamburgers, and then how you run your McDonald store. Now the th thing about it is, along the way, this process, the students could actually be playing the game and be asked to fill in the blanks, like what part of the processes did they skip. Um, what what could they have been doing better? Is this game an accurate reflection, or are there different things that that need to be added? So I really see students being able to do process evaluation as a way of effectively saying if if they know the agribusiness process, and that's one way that that we use the game. The other way that that using the game is actually looking at this as a a public relations or marketing tool. Does this work or doesn't this work? What aspects of marketing did you see there? What aspects of market outreach did you see through this game? So I think with process evaluation, I can see when you're talking about this, I can see using the McDonald game for agribusiness or marketing, but I can also see that there's other games out there that talk about uh, the, the manufacturing process that should be, that should be able to do this also. I like that. Chris, oh, and yeah, I just want one comment on the McDonald's game. I mean, the interesting thing about McDonald's game is is Kate alluded to that it does have a bias, and it's interesting because it does a good job, and it's a very quick, fast iteration of a game. Uh, however, you know, as as the instructor, you have to know going in that there's these biases out there. Um, not all games are third-party, unbiased sources. Uh, so so uh, the designers of the games have, can have certain agendas in the game, and that's something you as an instructor need to be aware of, uh, especially when it comes to not wanting to skew your data, um, because the McDonald's game is very anti-big business. It's very pro-animal rights and very pro-workers' rights. So a student going in there thinking that this is an unbiased game is going to be in for a, a bit of a shock. Um, Whereas if you, if you lay out these biases up front, then the students can come in and they can, they can, they can provide uh, feedback knowing that there's a bias there. Chris, I have a better idea. Instead of laying out the biases up front, a teacher could say, okay, play this game, 
and then you tell me what the biases were after the game, and then we can get some of that critical thinking in there. Yep, that works as well. Cool. Okay, uh, anything else you guys want to say about process evaluation type questions? The other thing I would say is that uh, when it comes to games and process evaluation is most of that happens behind the scenes and the only time you notice it is whenever something goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. Let's, let's move on to the next type of question which I'm calling net effect. And basically these questions have to do with um, what's the overall effect that we have on students when we do XYZ. So here are some examples. What is the effect of completing 30 credits online at Front Range Community College? So that question has to do with this more global learning. Um, like, like if I looked at a student who completed 30 credits of online courses at Front Range, what kind of effect is going to remain with that student? Um, what did they learn? Did they learn how to read better? Because now everything is is visual and they've got to read and pay attention to detail. Did, is that what they learned? And is that the thing that's going to stay with them the rest of their life? Um, another type question, can the net effects be attributed to the course games versus just maturation, just having some students just start growing up and um, becoming better thinkers because it was just part of the natural process. So these are net effect questions, kind of, I picture them as um, stuff the student's going to take with them the rest of their life. And what part in that was our game or our class or, or whatever. So um, the next slide talks about the traditional methods for how we would collect that data, it usually has to do with a, some sort of longitudinal tracking system. So if you work in the Colorado Community College system, we have this thing called Banner, and it keeps track of grades, and you can request to get some data, and you could find out grades from students over several semesters or cohorts of students, um, and, and just really tracking them over time. Another way is you can just set up an experiment or a quasi-experiment. An experiment is where you would randomly assign s students to a control group and the, another half of the students to a treatment group and then compare, but that's called, that, that would be an experiment if you actually were able to randomly assign students. If you cannot randomly assign them, it's called quasi-experiment, and that's where you still would have we call it then a comparison group and a treatment group. And you can see, um, you give, say one group works on the game and one group doesn't work on the game, and you can start measuring uh, what kind of effects stayed with the students who worked on the games versus those who didn't. And traditionally we use this thing called ex post facto research, which is after the fact, that's Latin for after the fact, and it's basically we can, after the fact, look at grades from students who took classes online versus students who took classes on campus or students who used games or students who didn't use games. It's, it's after the whole experience, the whole class, the whole course, the whole degree, the whole whatever is over, um, you, you can survey students or just check uh, with grades, watching them longitudinally. So those are traditional ways that we would answer net effect questions. Um, so our next slide then says, how could you collect this information using games or other non-traditional methods? So I'll start off. And really with net effect, uh, with most games, uh, they have that leveling bar and they also assign levels, the experience bar and the levels from my last example. And the other thing they have is they have obvious displays of achievement. Uh, so uh, what happens is uh, once you level, you get this wonderful, glorious 
you know, ah oh, moment uh, where you where you level, and it's accompanied by a wonderful noise that can be basically summed up as a ding. And so uh, people will actually put that in chat. They'll say, hey, I dinged, and that means they leveled. So you, so you have this net effect component. You're building, you're building, you're building. You're watching your little meter keep on coming up, coming up, coming up. Once you get near the end, all of a sudden you get this wonderful, gorgeous display, uh, and then uh, now you start over again, and you keep moving forward. So, so really what you're seeing in, in gaming is the net effect for games is they're reaching a certain level. Uh, some courses that have implemented gamification in their course, uh, basically they assign grade levels to levels of achievement. So they'll say there's this many points or experience points in the class, and then you need to get an A, you need to be a level 20 or above. And they'll have a whole scale that says, you know, level one is from zero experience to this level. You know, just like you normally set out your grades, percentages, uh, that's sort of what they do. It's just that you break it down more on a, a micro level where maybe instead of just five levels, a student can be, can be graded out at, you have like 20 or 30 levels within your course and you, you assign which grade applies to which range of levels. So it's just, it's the same concept we have in grading. It's just a matter of uh, breaking it out into sort of, sort of these smaller micro levels. Uh, these games uh, definitely use a ton of longitudinal uh, tracking system. They're, they're now, just now starting to data mine uh, players' decisions in games. Uh, so like how you can run progress reports in, D in D2L, your LMS, uh, and your LMSs are now starting to go ahead and pull in analytics. These games are now starting to get into analytics. They're, they're looking at how do players interact in game? How do players uh, engage in the content in the game? Um, and so really what you're looking at from, from your end is it definitely could, could also be um, more screenshots. Uh, having them do a reflection paper easily would be another way to do that summative assessment there. Um, you could have them do screen captures or uh, screen cast to look at summative assessment as they're going through. So you can really sort of collect a lot of this, this information as far as, as, you know, really looking at how the students have changed. Because one of the things I've done in my classes is that I've even seen even in screenshots where when they first start out, their screenshots are very you know, just general, they're taking the entire screen. And by the end of the semester, their start, students are starting to put very specific items in the screen. And they're, they're, they're really sort of using, utilizing that canvas they have of their screen to really sort of crush as much information in there as they can. So they make these gorgeous infographic screenshots um, to, to really sort of show me what they're doing. Uh, instead of sending me five screenshots, they now start sending me two screenshots because they figure out a way to open up a second window and other things so that they can get multiple information into one screenshot. So even just looking at the progression of, data, of information submitted is another way to look at that net effect. Nice, Chris. Okay. Uh, the minute you started talking about net effect, mm -hmm. I had to think of Oregon Trail. Why? Because everything, I mean, talking with teachers, <laughs> talking, talking with people who aren't teachers, talking with adults who are about 30, everybody remembers Oregon Trail. What, what was, the, and, and what is the huge impact that Oregon Trail made on so many people out there? I mean, it's it's really something about that. Now, I don't know if they remember everything about the settlers. I don't know if they remember every you know what the key components are. But there's some reason for engage for an engagement factor that Oregon Trail made an impact on on everyone. <laughs> so, we're talking about a net effect, I would love to see something that, that that really studied Oregon Trail and why it had this kind of on um, why it had this kind of impact on students um, the other thing that I was going to say because when I keep when you keep bringing these things up I start thinking about how this kind of assessment can can actually be made by by students in inside a class and and what exactly they could do and I do have to go to the that there have been designed some games right now that that can do something like that and I'm going to screen share one of these that I, I think do that right now and and that one is budget hero I think you could have student I think you could have students um, going ahead and playing budget hero 
And I think that, that you could trace longitudinally if this made an impact on their understanding. And, and budget here, is, I believe, is much more about economics than it is about, is it, it is about accounting. But the feedback we've gotten from students who have done it in different classes is that they wish they had played it while they were taking their, their um, intro to micro and intro to macro classes. I think Budget Hero might be one of those games out there that can make, that can make kind of the big impact that you would see with, with the net effects. Um, the other thing when talking about net effect related questions, I wouldn't mind having students also talk about uh, talk about how the the net effect that they that they think that a, a certain game had, um, whether it be on their understanding of a concept, or or whether when it comes to Budget Hero, um, whether it would have it on the budget. I like that idea. You know, I, I, I love you guys' ideas. I like how games have the obvious displays of achievement. That's this idea of longitudinally tracking somebody, but it's so real time. It's there for the student to benefit from. It's there for the teacher to benefit from. And you don't have to wait so long. So I really like that idea. I also like that idea of the data mining and the analytics. Um, on the spot and I think that's why I like analytics is because you can uh, get stuff quicker I might be wrong about that than um, then waiting and doing something more formal um, you know longer after the fact I love the research question it would be fun to ask people did you play Oregon Trail and what do you remember from it and I can't tell you how many times I've talked to adults now who still refer to the Oregon Trail and um, they remember when their doctor died and all that stuff. So that would be good. And I like that idea of budget hero. I had a hard time in economics. I think maybe that that would have helped me. So um, even though it's not a competition, I feel like this is a competition. And I think games are winning on this one as well. I think they have some, some advantages that we don't have when we don't have games and um, technology right at our fingertips that, that gives us this information very quickly. Okay, anything else on net effect related questions? No, Monica, other than, than you're supposed to be the skeptic. So you're going to have to be more skeptical, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Chris and I aren't the skeptics, okay? <laughs> I have to tell you, I, I used to be skeptical until I started this MOOC, and um, I'm learning a lot, and uh, now I just wish I had more technology skills. Okay, I'll try to be more skeptical. Okay, okay, please. Okay. okay. Alrighty, let's go on to the next type of question, which is goal-based, and goals are, um, you all have a goal, right? You my goal on um, my New Year's Eve sort of resolution or goal this last year was to see more movies at the movie theater. So um, what I have learned is that when I said Let's, I want to see more movies, it was really hard to know what more movies meant. What I realized a couple months into it is I needed to say I need to see four movies a month and then that was going to be easier for me to reach that goal. And what I learned with my New Year's resolution is that I needed my goals to be SMART. SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time bound. So if I wanted to see more movies in 2012, I needed to be specific. Like I'm going to see for a month. Measurable? Yes, because I can count those. It was hard for me to count, I'm going to see more movies, right? Attainable, is it, is it realistic? Yeah, well, I, attainable. Can I see four movies in a month? Does my budget allow it? Is it realistic that I go to a movie every weekend? Sure. Is it time bound? Yes. Uh, my time was a month. Okay, so that's a goal, and I know you all have them. And the more specific you can make their goal, the easier it is to attain those goals. So 
um, examples of questions that are goal-based would be your basic, did we meet or exceed our goal? If not, what could we have done differently? And then you start asking those questions. Um, say your goal was to sign up 500 people in the MOOC, you could ask, well, why weren't people signing up? Uh, were we being unrealistic? So then you can start asking questions about your goal. Now, let's look at the next slide. The traditional methods for collecting data, I realize I, here I used a front range term. We have an office called Institutional Research, and they're the people who give us data, and we can ask them how many people signed up for a certain class. Um, so there's those sorts of sources to see if you reached your goal. Uh, tracking systems that you've either purchased or developed, who would, you know, count the number of people who signed up for the MOOC or whatever. Um, or further qualitative methods, um, surveys, interviews, focus groups, to understand the reasons why or why not, like why people weren't signing up for your MOOC or why people were signing up for your MOOC. And that can help you um, in understanding why you did or didn't reach your goal and um, maybe help you when you're setting next year's goals or whatever. So goal-based questions have to do with a starting point of a SMART goal, a specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time-bound goal, and whether or not you met that. So our discussion then is how could you collect this information using games or other non-traditional methods? I guess I'll grab it again. It's almost like a game show here. I get the buzzer. So the thing <laughs> is, is that uh, I'm going to go back to quests. Uh, really, uh, every single quest in any game is typically very well written. Uh, it's definitely goal-based. You have your end result. Uh, so there are time quests as well. Uh, in fact, World of Warcraft is now adding a new feature in their, their newest update called Scenarios. And what that is, is it normalizes everybody, so it puts everyone in the same gear and the same everything uh, on a level playing field, and it measures how quickly can you solve the dungeon. And so it's giving, you, giving players a standard set of uh, criteria, and the goal is to complete it as fast as possible. So um, games are starting to get into this area of uh, realizing gamers are very goal-oriented. And, and that's what you'll see, is you'll see a lot of gamers are very goal-oriented. Or, goal they want to know what are the parameters, and why is that? Well, if you look at the, if you, look at the, if you pull up my screen, you'll see that, um, you know, they're very specific as far as what the gamer needs to do. Um, it's, it lays it out. It says, it says you need to obtain these four things. Uh, you also get a map, so you sort of get an idea of where it's at in the game. Uh, and then you sort of give a description of what the uh, person talking to you is giving you. Uh, then basically, once you complete, you get a reward. You also know what the rewards are up front. So a lot of games tell you what the reward is, and then what happens is as a player, you decide, do you is that are the rewards worth it? Um, is it is it worth you doing this? The other thing that's interesting about uh, games is typically they will again they go back to the visual cue. They will color code a lot of these quests, and so hard quests are are orange in color, uh, medium difficulty quests are ye are yellow, and easy quests are green. And quests that are no longer worth your time are gray. And so that's something else you start seeing a lot in these games. They really understand their players are are very goal oriented and so what they've done is they've gone ahead and they they've used visual stimuli to indicate what is worth their time and and and, and the level of effort that's needed uh, because you know you may not be feeling up to a very difficult quest that time uh, so you might want to just focus on green quests instead so um, a tracking system again it goes back to that leveling bar uh, in games they have that progress meter that shows you how to get there um, you have lots of different uh, Back, background information that's there uh, from qualitative methods. It's game. It's sites like Wowhead. It's like these forums that are out there where where you have p these players are are just giving this free information uh, to the gaming companies to pull from. So that's sort of how gamers look at goal oriented. It's very 
uh, very specific because uh, you can tell real, real quick if the achievement, if the quest is not well written, because what happens is people stop doing the quest. And so as a game, as a game maker, you can see, because uh, you're tracking what players are doing, you can see which quests are not getting, co getting covered. And so that's some of that instantaneous feedback you get is, is when it comes to goals is players, like I said, players can vote with their feet. And uh, in a game, a large game like World of Warcraft, you can avoid certain quests. And so players only pick quests and things that, that, re that resonate with them that they want to go ahead and accomplish. Nice. Nice. How about you, Kay? Okay. Well, um, it's one of our themes for this week. Badges. Okay? It, it's gamification. And you can take it into any class. And and we have and we are having discussions about what's the difference between a badge and experience of points and achievements and awards. Okay, so when it comes to these goal-based questions, you can you can specify what the goal is, and you can give them a badge or an award or an achievement or experience points. So you can actually and you can actually game design this. So so that's where I think it's really valuable. And like I said, this week we are we do have badges. And we and we are focusing on that. So we even have missions this uh, we even have missions this week that you can go ahead and you can take a look at, at the different badges. And and we have here: Are you willing to accept your badge mission? And and <laughs> and, and for this week, <laughs> we are trying to come up with a goal um, to to really look at badges and what kind of criteria you would need to, to actually be able to assign a badge. Whether it's a badge in your classroom, or for us, we're, we're actually looking at, at badges we might be able to give out through the games MOOC or, or some other professional development for teachers. So, so we're talking about a games-based learning badge, uh, a connected educator badge. Um, also, there's been some conferences out there that have been giving out some badges for doing specific goals and specific, you know, specific measurable, attainable, realistic, time-bound goals. So during this conference, this three-day conference, you have to do these certain things to be able to get a badge. And what's also kind of cool about that, some of these badges are not only what you have to accomplish, but your fellow conference goers have to have also vote you into these kind of things. So, so that makes it really, so this kind of badging system really, I think, can hit on, on what you have here for, for the goal-based questions. Okay. This is where I'm going to bring in my skepticism and see what you guys have to say about this. I, I will give you this with games. Um, it seems to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, assessment is a built-in part of games. Uh, you've got the, the tracking systems, those, those um, badges and the quest. It seems like a lot of what games are is this built-in um, built assessment to where you get an award for accomplishing something, for making the quest successfully. Am I right? Well, an award is an award is usually a little different. What you described would probably be experience points, and the experience points would probably build up to you getting a, a level. If it's one specific thing, that be might be that you knew about ahead of time, and it's kind of a, a little bit difficult or a little funny or something like that. That would probably be an achievement. Okay. Okay. I, I, okay, I get that now about experience points. But, but you have to admit that games seem to have this built-in part, at least there's some part of the accomplishment of the person playing the game. Right? Yes. Yep. Okay. <laughs> this is weird because we're not all in the same room, and so I'm talking to a screen. Okay, so here's my issue. I teach math at Front Range Community College, and one of the things that our campus has decided to do, and I know they do this in the online learning math classes, is we have our students do their homework on these math homework systems. There are, some are called My Math Lab, Math Zone, WebAssign. It seems like each publisher 
has one of these these systems. Um, now the ones I'm going to be talking about are going to be like my, my math lab or math zone or web assign. There's this one it's called Alex A-L-E-K-S. This one does not work this way. I, I think Alex was really well done but the others and the ones that we end up using uh, don't work this way and so here's what happens and it's really frustrating and so maybe you could have a solution. I know they're not designed to be games but what happens is the the author writes a textbook, a regular paper textbook. Then some programmer comes and takes each exercise from the end of each section and say it's um, solve for x and there's some math equation there. Well then what the student sees on the screen is they see that problem solve for x and if they look in the textbook the equation might be 3x plus 1 equals 2 but when they look online it might be 4x plus 2 equals 3 and so what basically what happens is the numbers change and it's an it's an algorithm that changes the numbers so we call them algorithmically generated questions and so the basic question is the same as what you would see in the textbook except for when you do it on the computer um, the numbers will change a bit and so usually what happens is a student gets three chances to get that question right and then after three chances and it depends on how the teacher sets it up but after three tries the the student it, they'll fail that question but then they can click a button that says similar question so then you get another algorithmically generated problem that get it that gets at the same skill which would be solving for X well what happens to our students and I've seen it many times other teachers have seen it students talk about it students tell each other what they do is they look at the answer because there's actually a button that says help me solve this and or view an example and so what they do they don't even look at the problem or try to solve the problem they they view the example and they notice oh there's a pattern and Kay was talking about patterns earlier and math is patterns but the pattern that they're learning in the in, through these homework system isn't the pattern we want them to learn like they might notice Oh, whatever number is in front of the X, all you do is double it and that's the answer. When in fact that's not the process us math teachers were wanting them to go through. So learning did happen because they were recognizing the pattern. But they weren't learning algebra and part of what we're teaching in math is the proper algebraic rules so that you know how algebra works when you leave the class. So my frustration is because this is a very goal based thing for the students the students goal is I am going to finish my homework and get 100% the goal isn't learning the concept and so I've actually had students come into my office hours and say this okay I did all the homework on my math lab I got 100% now could you help me understand how to do it because I really I don't get the concept and I just want to strangle the student and yet it's not the, really the student's fault because they did exactly what we asked them to do. So my beef, and I will say it, it is a beef that I have, is that it's so easy to sort of cheat with these types of homework systems. And I know they're not games officially, but it is something that's frustrating. And I'm wondering if you two have anything, any suggestions or comments about that. Absolutely. <laughs> Taking notes the whole time. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, um, what a comment might, that might be made was, "Oh, they're gaming the system," yes. and 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 that's the thing about. I, I think that's the wrong vocabulary word. I think I think, but but I think you you properly discussed it. They are recogni they are recognizing the pattern based on the information that they're being given. And I think it's an absolute when it comes to games. And and this is something I'm going to start putting in all presentations uh, from from this point forward. Is that some pe some people are looking at at games to be a silver bullet that have them play a game, they'll get engaged and they'll learn it. That's not true because there are bad games out there. 
There are bad games out there that will not allow them to engage in the content, but rather will be, will be about pattern recognition and learning the process of playing it, whether it be a game or a homework manager, than the actual concept. And, and it's absolutely necessary for us as teachers to not only play the game so that we can recognize it, so it might mean playing it a bit to recognize that, but also, and this is funny because we're talking about a gaming metacognition badge, that we have to be aware of the learning that's happening in these games, meaning are they learning the content or are they learning the process? And, and, and actually, Cherry, Cherry Emerson and I, when we were looking at Doffer is Dying, we did see that. We saw that there was a specific amount of time that you would have the students play Doffer is Dying. Is because, and the reason was because some of the students, after a little bit, and by a little bit I mean five minutes, were able to adjust to the fact that, 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 that they, they saw the pattern and they were able to apply the pattern. So I think when we're, even when we're looking at these things, we're going to have to see length of, length of time to see how long does it take to, to develop this pattern. And I also think, you know, when you were talking about the, the, the math textbook writer and then the, the, the programmer coming there, the programmer is looking for the solution, is looking for what algorithm can I put, can I put there, and is it necessarily going back and looking at actually how people play these. So I think us as educators, educators and instructors, we absolutely have to play these games and know how people learn in games. So back to the metacognition, that we have to know how these games teach. I think it's not enough for us to go, oh, they, it's PowerPoint. Whenever I pull up PowerPoint in my class, the students love uh, doing a review of PowerPoint Jeopardy. No, I think we have to realize that, that there are certain game mechanics and aspects that make PowerPoint Jeopardy appealing. And, and, and the thing of it is, are, are we merely engaging or entertaining, or have we, have we introduced a pedagogy that allows students to learn these things? And, and I hate to say it, but the, what you were describing with the, the homework managers is it, it, might, it might make it easy on the instructors because there's auto grading. It might make it easy on the students because, again, there's auto grading. <laughs> and, and, and also they might be able to get their homework done fa faster by doing it that way, but, but, the, the learning, but the learning isn't happening. And I think we totally have to be aware when we use you know, intelligent agents, when we use these automated systems, when we use these homework managers, is learning happening there? Are we having them go through the motions and go through a process. I agree. I like what you said. How about you, Chris? Well, I mean, funny you should talk about math. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, games is that uh, most games are very math-driven. Um, a lot of it's behind the scenes, like probability, where it's looking at what type of loot drops. And so you do have... Uh, your students, what would, be, what would be interesting is asking your, your students what games they play um, and seeing what they do because I'll, I'll show you, um, again, using World of Warcraft, what, what's going on. But I think one of the first things we have to address, uh, especially when it comes to the homework management systems in, in, in learning in general, is it really comes down to individual motivation. Um, how motivated, how focused or how driven is the student because um, I, I've had students who, who it doesn't matter what tips or tricks or tactics I use, uh, they don't perform well whether it's in class or even in a game. Um, they're just not engaged, they don't want to do the work. Um, you do have some students that do have an issue with, with learning and that's, that's, that's fine, they may need to get that documented. But the thing you get into is that with the use of the the systems, I mean, it's all it's all repetition. Um, you know, it depends on the number of attempts you give them. Are you using algorithmic problems where you're changing numbers? The the concepts still the same. The mathematical concepts still the same, or are you just changing uh, changing numbers? I know there are there are quite a few instructors out there that let the students take two or three attempts and they don't change any of the numbers in the test at all. And all the students do is they just they just submit a blank answer because the students are lazy or they're time driven or, or they're time starved and so they don't allocate enough time to work, actually work on it. And so they figure to game this system, the homework manager, they go ahead and they um, just hit submit on a blank form and they just look at the answers 
and then they do the reverse engineering um, to get the numbers if you change the numbers or um, they go ahead and they uh, just copy the answer key. they print off the answer key or they take a screenshot of all the answers uh, and they go ahead and just take it again and fill out all the questions I mean one way to look at that is time on test how fast do they get through it that's something you can look at from an instructor on a homework manager now uh, back to games so basically uh, there's base stats for every student and notice it's all numeric and so each item that's in that the character wears has a specific plus and minus to it so uh, students are always balancing the numbers and for each type of player they have there there are abilities that they want to increase so for instance uh, if you're a, if you were a caster or a mage you'd want to increase intellect uh, that would be your score that you want to have um, so what happens is is players immediately go to a site uh, like this one and this is aptly named called elitist jerks so with a name like elitist jerks you can tell these guys are pretty engaged in what they're doing in this game and so um, what they're doing here is they're talking about uh, upcoming stuff's going on they're looking at the test realm so these are very motivated they're going out of their way to do this and these people have created a spreadsheet to help players just sort of plug in and play around so they can figure out what gives them the most damage per second or DPS. So what is DPS? This is what the players are looking at. Their majority of players are looking at um, printouts like this. There are add-ons and that's a whole different realm of games that you get with very large games like World of Warcraft is you can actually purchase, uh, you can actually get and download and implement what are called add-ons. These are additional program software that are tailored to, to track specific things for the learner. Uh, and so they get real-time feedback. They're pulling game data that the game that the game manufacturer has access to, the player now has access to that data and they're making use of that data. And so what they're doing, and this is World of Logs, and this is a ton of anal analysis from World of Warcraft looking at uh, damage done, they're looking at damage taken, healing done, and there's tons and tons of this data out there that they're looking at. And so what they're looking at here is the players that are playing this are doing math all the time. Um, and you talked about, okay, well, are they simply gaming the system or are they, 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 they don't understand the mechanic, they find one or one or areas. And quite honestly, the answer is a little bit of both. I think, like I said, like I said earlier, it comes back to player motivation is, is the player looking at it at, I need to have the skill set to perform better in life or in the game or are they a casual player or a casual student that is simply there because they their the motivation is not there they're not interested in necessarily excelling they're just simply interested in getting their C and moving on um, I think motivation has more to do with um, you know the student accomplishment as opposed to the game, what environment the students exposed to if you have a under motivated student it could be the most immersive environment you could ever create and they're not going to perform if you have a highly motivated student, you could be in an environment that's not very engaging and they still will perform very well. Excellent. And might I say, I love that graph right there with the different colors. It just warms my heart. <laughs> okay. Anything else, you two, on the goal based? Um, you, you said some good things. I think, yes, I love that graph. There you go. I, I, I zoomed in so you guys could see it. I love it. Okay. Anything else on goal based questions? No, I think that's it. Okay. Let's go to the next slide here. We're going to talk about comparison questions. Um, comparison questions where we compare. Do students who play game A perform better on the final exam than students who play game B? So that's, um, that's a pretty straightforward one. Um, when Kay and I were talking about this MOOC a few weeks back, she actually talked about this game called Free Rice. Um, so here's a question. How much would students practice if they practiced on the game Free Rice versus a quiz for points? Um, so if you've played Free Rice before, it's kind of like um, sort of maybe a flashcard. I don't know. Kay probably has a better term for it. But it's the kind of game where you have to answer questions maybe about the capitals of the 50 states or something like that and it kind of just 
or you can have math facts in there, like two times two, three times seven. Um, it's kind of a quick. Um, I I just think of them as flashcards. Is that what you would call those? Call that game, K flashcards. Um, actually, actually, what this game does, and it, it does it pretty well. And and what we should say about this game really quickly is is yeah, it kind of was a comparison thing because the the inventor of this game, the game designer, actually was watching his son um, study for the SATs and thinking how boring it was. <laughs> <laughs> and would and would his son study as much <laughs> if if he was if he was doing like kind of the flashcard traditional studying for SATs versus something that was a little more interesting? And since he was a programmer, what he did was he actually made this as a game. So instead of those flashcards that that you know we, we studied or those books and then and then you had to take the the endless paper and pencil quizzes, instead it, it got put on this. So when it comes to a comparison question, it might be something like this. Um, I mean, a lot of times these things are called drill and kills um, because you just you just keep repeating them. But it comes back to with the comparison questions. If if you're doing this kind of assessment, you might have a motivational question. You might totally ha be asking the question. Um, will the students study longer or spend more time with the content? If, if if it's in a format that's more interesting. Okay, I love it. So that brings up this this idea of a comparison question. So a student who's students who studied using free rice versus students who just studied using whatever book, you know, who did better? And so the traditional ways that we have for collecting this data is to set up two groups. Now, if we have the luxury of randomly assigning people to each group, that's called an experiment. And um, that's where one group will get one learning method and the other group will get the other. And then if you have randomly assigned them to those two groups, the idea is that, that the randomization kind of equalizes the group. So you've got an equal number of motivated students in each group, an equal number of non-motivated students in each group, or whatever the other factors are. And then you give them each their method, their teaching and learning method, and then you can compare. Um, you can give it whatever your assessment is at the end. You can compare and see who did better. That's just your basic kind of comparison. Now, when you don't have random assignment, you, like um, on campus when you're teaching, you might have an 8 o'clock Monday, Wednesday class that you're going to compare to an 8 o'clock Tuesday, Thursday class. Well, um, then we call them comparison groups versus if it was an experiment with random assignment, we call them control groups. So either way, you get your two groups and, like I said, one group has the thing you're trying to, to test and the other group gets the old method or the book method or the boring method or whatever and then you compare how they do. Now how do you see, oh I guess I need to go forward a couple of slides here, um, and we'll go to the discussion now. Um, how could you collect this information using games or other non-traditional methods? Well, uh, really what you see games doing is uh, they're using, as far as comparison and, and looking at that, is what they do is they do leaderboards and they do direct achievement um, comparisons. So um, what I have up here is, again, from World of Logs, and this is uh, basically a leaderboard of who is doing the most uh, damage in, in a specific location. So, um, you know, you can choose healing as well. So look at that um, just because that's another aspect. And so just looking at who the best healers in the games are. So there's competition there where they're comparing it. And so what, stu what, what a player will do is they'll look at this and they'll go, okay, I want to be like that person. And so what they do is they find a top performing person who has a similar uh, class or character to them, and they look at their build. They look at their model of how they've created their character, and they try to duplicate that. Um, so that's really sort of what you're seeing uh, comparison in games. The next uh, item I talked about was uh, achievements. And so uh, basically 
where you have um, quests, you're finishing quests, and you have those goal-oriented ones. Sort of the capstone or achievements that are there are these are the what are called achievements, and so uh, they assign points for achievement, uh, what they feel is relevant to the time necessary to complete the achievement. And basically, what you see is that you can actually go into uh, World of Warcraft and you can actually compare, pick someone, you can actually compare your achievements against that person. So um, most re most comparisons are showing up as leaderboards in in games. Uh, from the gamer development side, what they're doing is they're doing the same exact thing you, you already talked about, where they're really pulling out the data and they're going, okay, based on these variables, based on these filters, um, what can we what can we pull from uh, our players? And what most game companies are looking at is they're looking at the demographic data that the, the gamers provided when they signed up for their account. And they're looking at like zip code, they're looking at uh, addresses, they're looking at what nation, where your IP address is from, things like that. Okay, I like that idea. Okay. okay. Here's what I really got to say about the comparison question. And if, if you're evaluating a class that's using something versus a class that's not, this is so hard. And, and this is why it's hard, because... If you are using, I mean, if, if in, say, one class you are using the, the package that came out with the publisher and you are using the publisher test bank questions, then you give it, are you going to compare the students who you're having learned the content playing a game or any other kind of Web 2.0 or immersive thing and then have them go, and then have them go back to, say, say taking the questions from the publisher test bank? And this is where I think the evaluation is so hard. And like, I mean, this week, one of our discussions that we put up is epistemic network analysis. Okay, and that, you know, that's really looking, um, is, is the student starting to act like they're a member of the community of practice or a member of the profession? And I mean, if you're comparing it to something that you're doing tradi uh, traditional quizzes or assessments with, it, it, it can really, oh, I mean, that's where I have the problem. Uh, the really apples to oranges, and it's not like apples to oranges. It's, 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 it's so very different. And for me, when it comes to that, to that comparison, the reason I have the difficulty is that, that students who are using the, the, the publisher test bank and who only get the textbook and the PowerPoints provided from the publisher, I, I feel like we're almost cheating them. By, by making them be in that part of the test. It's like I want to get I want to give them everything I, I would want to give them everything else. So when it comes to when it comes to this comparison of comparing a a class that does not have immersive or game based learning versus a class that, that does, I, I I see I see a real problem in either feeling like I'm cheating one of the classes were or making the the second class the the games or immersive learning class take a test that was that was specifically designed and and taught to be a teach to the task kind of situation so so for me the comparison question comparing the two that's that's when i i become very conflicted and about that's that's the only intelligent thing i can say on that sorry okay <laughs> No, that was good. That was good. I like what you both had to say. Um, I, I think it's hard. I've seen a lot of teachers will do uh, projects in their classroom where, where they will give one class the online homework, the, the web-based learning homework, and then in the other section of the class, they'll collect paper homework and grade it. And um, I've seen that done a lot. And it is one of those things where you're you're getting at you're getting at different things. You're getting at motivation because there's there is a lot going on that's different when you're writing for paper on paper versus doing it on the computer. But the general idea is there. But um, as with any research and any inquiry process, some questions and processes are better than others. Okay. Let's uh, move on. If you guys are good, we'll go on to satisfaction-related questions. And you've all had many satisfaction surveys given to you in your life. 
So we'll try to get up here to this slide that says, how satisfied are students with, and that might be the particular game or whatever. Um, and traditionally, as the next slide shows, we usually give satisfaction surveys, um, or we might have focus groups. A focus group is like a group interview where we have a facilitator asking a group of people questions or just one-on-one -on -one interviews. And the, the goal of satisfaction type questions are exactly that. How satisfied were you? So where do satisfaction questions fit into this world of learning with games? OK, I'll take that one first. <laughs> okay. um, first of all, when um, Chris and I have worked on projects, we always give students a chance to talk about satisfaction. There's no question about that. Um, I think that when it comes to assessment or evaluation, if you're looking at, at it, will this game work, I, and for your class, I would look, and I go back to Keller's ARCS model, and that's about the best picture I can get up there, but um, attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. I think as teachers, we need to look at that. And quite honestly, we need to look at, I mean, when, when I mentioned the PowerPoint Jeopardy is working, well, that's because PowerPoint Jeopardy does this. <laughs> if you're giving it right before a, a review for a big test, guess what? Jeopardy will get their attention rather than, than a lecture. Relevance, they're going to take a big test. There's a high stakes thing going on. It's very relevant. <laughs> they, they want to know, they, they want to know the answers to the questions and they also want to know they want <laughs> that they know the answers to the questions. So, so the next part, that confidence level, they already have that. Uh, Jeopardy is a frame game that we're all familiar with so they already have the confidence level that they that they can that they can play along in this kind of format because they're aware of it and then because they do get that instant feedback and think about that if you're playing PowerPoint Jeopardy you're getting a lot more feedback in a classroom than you are taking a test so they get that immediate satisfaction and they know from the feedback did they get that answer right or not and even if and I'm because again it's a frame game and we all know this they automatically they've already been trained in their heads you know even if they don't even if it's somebody else who's taking that turn in their head they're playing that turn also so Keller's ARCS model of motivational design for education totally works and, and I, I say that it has to go back to us as teachers, you know, knowing the metacognition or the learning that happens in the game so that when we decide on pulling something up, we know that a review before a test, guess what, <laughs> it, 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 something like this would work perfectly. Excellent. I love that model. Very nice. And, and totally agree. Uh, basically what we've done in gaming classes is giving the students a place to talk and giving them surveys, giving them uh, information. Uh, the other thing I've done is another way I've introduced games is as uh, either extra credit uh, work where basically um, I really put the students, because uh, one of the things I'm looking at when I'm using games in my classes, I'm looking at students' critical thinking skills. And so I always make sure I include uh, a question that they have to answer as far as rating the game. Um, you know, what do they like? What do they didn't like? Um, you know, would they recommend this to their friend? And basically, I, I always ask them why. I don't. I don't. I try not to give them any yes/no answers uh, because I really want them to think about uh, their responses to. Uh, the game and where's and, and the other thing is I always have asked my students in the past is is how do you see this game fitting into this class so that's one thing I'm doing right now in my intro to business class is one of the first questions I had them uh, answer during the first week of class was uh, besides introducing themselves was well how do you see this game World of Warcraft fitting into business and uh, what's in it, I've, we've got some really nice results from uh, the students post and seeing what's going on. And well, someone's, someone's playing it. <laughs> okay. For some reason, I was getting uh, 
lots of audio. But what I was saying was basically that um, what I'm what I'm seeing is that there is there seems to be a lot of ability to give students that that ability to talk about what's going on. So you can use that in your class, whether that is a class discussion session, whether that is a uh, having the students uh, respond to a private survey or going ahead and having them um, you know fill out a discussion board that's in your class okay so um, when when it comes to this, Basically, I guess we'll just have Monica continue on because I'm looking at the time and I'm so loving the discussion. <laughs> but I'm just afraid Monica's going to have to leave soon. No, actually, I'm doing good. I was worried about you guys, but I'm doing good. Okay. Uh, we are back on the PowerPoint here. Let's go to, oh, yes. This is called, uh, the next set of questions are called, Who are our students? And, um, if you look at the next slide then, basically uh, this set of questions just has to do with knowing who our students are. Um, so the next slide there says, what type of student prefers using the game to learn versus other modes? So there's all sorts of what type of, you know, who are our students, what type of students would learn. Um, in the olden days, people might have called this learning styles, but um, I don't know if that's holding water these days is what I understand. But if we go to the next slide, we talk about the traditional methods for collecting this sort of data is we have to ask our students if, they, if this is the kind of learning they are used to or if they learn well. So we would interview students or give them surveys, either paper, pencil, electronic, and then I just was at a conference the other day and I heard that uh, people are giving surveys in class and uh, having their students take the surveys on their smartphone. So I thought, I thought that was kind of a cool way to collect data. So what do you think about uh, collecting this sort of who are our students kind of information using games and other non-traditional methods? Well, um one of the things we're seeing is what I always do is I always do a survey in the beginning of my class uh, to get a feel for who my students are. So uh, I use a Desire to Learn, or you can use any any learning management system that you have. It is basically I create a uh, questionnaire. I have them fill out as part of their first week duties, and really what I'm looking at is um, asking them like, what is their access to the internet? Um, you know, how, is it something that they're, is it from their home, is it from a coffee shop? Uh, I ask, are they mostly mobile, or are they using a computer, you know, where they, where their computer's located at, where their internet's located at, and I ask them, you know, um, have they done games before? Uh, what companies are doing, what gaming companies are doing, is, it's, it's very similar to what I just did, is, is that to actually play the game, you have to fill out demographic information. Uh, they ask you to put your name. They ask you typically ask you what are you male, female. They ask you to put a, a zip code or something else in there. So they're gathering this data as part of the um, introduction to go ahead and actually get into the game itself. And then they start looking at, and that's what they use as their filters, as we talked about in the previous section, on how to uh, compare the students and student groups. So as an instructor, you can simply just make a survey. Uh, in your in your quizzes or whatever, you could assign points to it or not. Uh, I found that assigning points to it makes students do it. Uh, if it's free, if it's not no points available, the students are less likely to do it. Uh, but the thing is, it helps give you a good f uh, idea of what's going on. You could probably also go to your uh, institutional research group and and possibly ask them for data as an instructor. But the worry there from an institutional level is typically if you know too much about your student. Are you going to bias your, your results? But so that's why I typically leave it to you know where's your internet at? Uh, have you been a gamer before? Um, you know where you know do you have ready ready access to a computer? Uh, because I've had I've had students in the past who their uh, their access to computers the library and that totally changes the way they play they look at the class. 
Okay, so uh, Monica, I pulled up something <laughs> that, that um, we've been using a bit. It's called Poll Everywhere. So, so with that instant audience, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with that instant audience feedback, um, people are using this. Um, people are also to get the instant feedback. Um, some instructors are going ahead and using Twitter. And they will be having it, you know, it'll be projected on the wall <laughs> while the, while they're teaching the class or giving the presentation and stuff like that. Now, the, the thing the thing about um, when it comes to who are who are your students? Very very valid point because it, at this point, while games are popular, not everyone uses games, and it depends on the level that they use games with. Somebody who plays Angry Birds. It is very different than, than somebody who, like Chris was showing you, makes a, an Excel spreadsheet about trying to figure out what it, what exactly, um, what points they need, what gear they need to play a certain game, and what what achievements that that they need to look at. Um, what I was also going and and that's something very important, you know, for an instructor to know. And to know your students and, and to know who's likely going to be able to learn this way and who's not. But quite honestly, we are going to have to teach them to learn in this method. Um, the reason is that, that simulations in the workforce are becoming more and more apparent. And the thing of it is also being able to interpret a simulation is also becoming extremely important for, for people. In a training session, and, and it doesn't matter if you're a, you know, if, if you're an air, a jet fighter pilot or if you're a police officer or whether you're a nurse, more and more things are going digital. And knowing how to actually function in these kind of environments Environments to do the training is, is going to be something that that's going to have to be required and when they have you do these and and when you are being required to do these kind of trainings it's it's about being able to pull the content from it and learn from it and not just get stuck in in, in the fact that you're working on a computer and it's digital and this isn't how you learned in your class in your classroom when you went through you know K through 12 so in a way, we are teaching by using this, and and you know we can scaffold. We don't have to put them in World of Warcraft for a full semester. We can scaffold, but teaching our students how to learn using this, I think, is also one of the requirements. So I think we we need to know who our students are. Okay. Well, I I I misspoke earlier in the session when I said I was a dinosaur. Because I actually do play a game. I actually play Spider Solitaire. It's my favorite. I'm very addicted to it. <laughs> but that's it. I uh, <laughs> I don't do anything else. So when you said uh, Angry Birds, I was thinking, hey, I, I do Spider Solitaire. So I think you're right, Kay. I think uh, we do have to kind of push our students to, to learn something new and, and work in a game. I like that, and I also like your instance feedback um, website, so that's very cool. Anything else on that one? Who are our students? Okay, I want what I wanted to comment on real quickly because you said spider solitaire. Okay, so just so you know, there's two educators um, who and and one of them that they were kind of working on this project, and I really hope that that we can get them to to publish something or at the very least blog about it. Um, and one of them is an instructional designer. The the other one is actually a testing coordinator, and they are work and they are playing the game Bejeweled. And they are actually testing it, but to see, um, they are looking at pattern recognition because that's what Bejeweled is. But they are looking at the different that the different circumstances when when they're in different circumstances, what allows them to concentrate and what doesn't allow them to concentrate, and what um, hitting the different levels what that does for motivation. So so th this is a, this is a shout out to two of the people in our games MOOC, um, <laughs> Melody Collier and and also Valerie Knoll that that we are waiting to read what they are researching when it comes on to bejeweled when it when it comes to when it comes to what kind of player and how you how you learn and and what you learn when you play these things 
Nice, nice. I like that. Okay, the uh, next set of questions are related to what are our students' experiences? So if you look at some of the examples there on the next slide, um, these questions are related to what, what they experience. So what do students view as engaging in an online course? How did the game help students learn? What is it about the game that enhanced learning? Um, normally, if we were to want to ask these kinds of questions, we would do something, we do a lot of this in math and science, is what's called think alouds. And that's where we would sit across from a student, it's just a one-on-one -on -one activity, and we would give the student a problem or have them play the game or whatever, and then have them talk aloud while they're going through the process. So a good friend of mine, Sherry Hosseini, she actually did her master's degree and this was her project. She did, she sat with students while they did their homework on one of those math homework learning systems that I was talking about earlier. And she sat with them to do a think aloud and she, so they would sit at her computer in her office and talk through the process and she would ask questions, well, what are, you, what are you doing? What did you find? You know, why are you doing that? And she kind of found out that students don't actually read the actual question. They look, they start looking right at the problem and just start doing something with the numbers. They don't even know what they're supposed to be doing. That's also, she also found out that students look for the patterns and try to cheat the, the system. But anyway, that whole process is called a think aloud. So that's normally how we could find out um, what students' experiences are in some sort of learning activity. So, if we go to the next slide, what do you think we could do in, in the context of games? Okay, um, well, in the context of games, what our students' experiences are, first of all, I'm not sure everyone knows about a Think Out Loud. I absolutely love Think Out Louds, and I think we need to be using those more, especially with form, um, form, um, formative assessment. And um, the reason is so that we can adjust at the beginning, especially if you're, if you're using a game. And, and I think we need to have these Think Out Louds, and, and even if it's just asking the class <laughs> or having them post in discussion to know whether or not they're getting, they're getting bogged down with the game's mechanics or if they're doing the content so that you can make your adjustments really quickly. Um, as far as our students' experiences, I'm going to have to go back to what I was talking about um, a little earlier, and that goes back to let's do screen captures. Okay, if if your student if your student can do if your student can do a screen capture, let's let's have let's have them do it. Okay, if your student can if your student can go ahead and and can write about it, have them have them do that. I mean, I think what with What's happening with us digitally, we can make everything a, so much richer for our students than, than we did before. And I, I think that we really need to strive for that. And for example, um, I'm hoping this is coming up, I'll know in a moment or two. Um, oh gosh, hold on, let me switch screens. But um, the example that I would really use is I would use if you want to see what's going on, I would say have them use a have them use a Flickr site, okay? Have them take the screen capture as they're going along, have them save it up there. They can they, and then they can share it. And while this is a Flickr um, slide share, your students could put something up like this up in PowerPoint, up in Prezi. They could be using a Pinterest site. But if we want to know what our students' experiences are, our students can show us this very richly. They can make machinimas. And what machinimas are, machinimas are, are, are a, as far as I'm concerned, are a fantastic concept. Machinima is a screen capture of the live 
things that are going on in 3D virtual environments. Now, your student could do an audio and be explaining what's going on. And here's why I think they're fantastic. Machinima are fantastic. Because this is a way that the tacit knowledge that's actually that your students might otherwise have a really hard time, you know, writing about in text, they can be narrating and they can be showing it to you. And the thing about it is, in the gaming community, there is a whole culture of this. I mean, for, you, if you take a look at going to YouTube and type in any of your videos, I, I'm sorry, and type in any of the games, World of Warcraft, EVE Online, any game, Club Penguin, you just type that in, and you would see how many videos there are on it. And they're not like, and they're not music videos. They're actual tutorials showing people how to do things. So there's this whole gaming culture that is about teaching and showing and explaining your experience. Not only just to, I want to tell my story, but so someone else can also experience this. So, so when it comes to, when it comes to our students sharing their experience, I say narrated slide, slide shares like, like we're showing here or, or, or videos. Because they're going to be on there anyway. There's a lot of, of decent um, and free and cheap things that they could use. A student could get on Google Hangout like we are now and, and do that kind of narration. I love that, Kay. Those are some really good ideas. Again, I think having access to these um, things like this, the Flickr and the screen captures in these games, I think it just makes a richer learning environment. So I, I think games win again. How about you, Chris? You got any comments on that one? Um, I would agree with what, what Kay said. I mean, a lot of what you're looking at is um, most uh, players who are playing games are now um, using multiplayer settings. So they're online using uh, some sort of voice over internet type of service, whether that's Google Hangout like we're in right now, or uh, Ventrilo, or some different things like that. Um, having the students, uh, you definitely have the students, record the students doing a doing a quest together, or especially if you're online, it'd be an easy way to do it. Uh, and face-to-face, -face, it would be having them, you know, you could also have them log on to the chat channel and have them interact there. Um, so, so definitely re you could record that, you could look, go back afterwards, and you could do um, some qualitative analysis of the gaming transcripts, uh, what was going on, and what was, you know, you could see what was going on the screen and what they're talking about. Uh, at the same time, you could definitely do a lot of, um, you know, seeing how it works, um, you know, using surveys, using, uh, again, I mean, one of the things I found very successful in my classes is uh, I, I established very early on with my students that, that I really want their honest feedback when it comes to the use of games in the course because that information is going to help me improve uh, the class in the future. And I've had quite a few students who responded to that that request because one of the big things that um, students aren't used to necessarily is uh, having what they talk about actually being acted upon in a class. And uh, it's, it's kind of nice to give them that instant feedback when it comes to uh, something that, that for some is difficult because some students aren't gamers. So um, the, again, it goes back to talking to them about you know, what are the core objectives, and, and one of the things we're always looking at is we're always learning, we're always trying to improve. I love it, Chris, and I love that idea of instant feedback. Okay, next, the next and last um, set of types of questions um, has to do with game component questions. So the example that I have on the next slide says, what features should my game include in order to engage students? And so. This is that whole part about the game. So why is it that I'm addicted to Spider Solitaire? What is it in that game that makes me want to play it every night? <laughs> so um, I couldn't really think of any other questions. How about you guys? Do you have any other game-related game component questions? Absolutely. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Absolutely, and and the funny thing is, I'm going to say tell everybody to go into the game MOOC and to go into the forum that talks about medic a metacognition badge. And even even though the even even though it's a badge, and and then they know you know all the jokes about the Girl Scout and the Boy Scout badges. Uh, <laughs> the reason I, I'm bringing it up is 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 it's a sign of mass of demonstrated mastery. 
but I would suggest people come into the forum, into the games MOOC, to talk about the metacognition and to think about what you're what you're teaching or 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 learning when you're playing a game. And I think that that teachers need to know that when they play a game, I think they need to need to look at it. And and even if it's as simple as the arcs model that we just had that we just had up that said, okay, that, that this game hits attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. Like the example we gave of the Jeopardy game. I think, our, I think faculty need to realize this. Now, if you're teaching something like a cultural anthropology class or a sociology class where it's you want the students to role play or empathize or you're going for the effective domain rather than the cognitive domain, that you would be looking for a game that really puts the student in the, cent in the center as an avatar and really have to go through and accomplish those things so that they could role play or so they, they could emphasize. I mean, if it's a math and if it's a simple math problem and it's just a matter of the, it's a drilling exercise, then it's a very different thing that you could look at. And for the free rice example, this was somebody, this was a student who was taking a standardized test who had to learn vocabulary. And instead of flashcards, the chances are they would spend more time. <laughs> they they would actually spend more time on it if if they were using if they were using um, free rice rather than something else. And the pictures that are up now are, are from Viking Quest. And Viking Quest uh, again, I think this uh, I think the instructor needs to to play the game. But when it comes to to Viking Quest, you'd be looking at that. Does it hit the content that you want it to hit? Are, are the different facts and the components there? And for Viking Quest, I, I, I think so. This was developed by the BBC. And I think a humanities instructor could easily go in and see if it, if it is hitting on what you want your students to be learning. Nice. I like that. How about you, Chris? Well, I think that, um, you know, one of the things you're, you're definitely looking at is, is I figured I'd pull up Spider of Solitaire for you. Thank you. Uh, so the thing about games is really you're looking at there has to be rules. And uh, what I found is most players uh, prefer that there's rules, there's preferences, and that they're consistently uh, in force. Uh, if things are constantly changing on you, it's very difficult for um, students to sort of look at and players are sort of look at the game as a whole because you're constantly having everything changed on you. Now, if you get an item that gives you the ability to bend some of those rules, that's fine. Uh, but if you can, are constantly changing the environment, then uh, players start losing interest. They, they don't like certain things they like the way it was done before. So consistency, um, the rules is, is really important. I think that uh, establishment of expectations early on in the class is something you definitely see a lot in games is that there is there's enough information and data out there uh, through websites and through uh, YouTube and other areas that students pretty, get a pretty good feel players get a pretty good feel of a game uh, they don't necessarily have that ability in a classroom because uh, they because uh, I mean most of us uh, don't have our entire session taped uh, that take people to go ahead and watch snippets of the instructor, but that might be a way to um, connect with your students more is having a brief intro video um, to the students. Uh, lots of games use cinematic effects to sort of highlight that might be something we can bring into uh, the classroom. Uh, I think that the immediate fe immediacy of feedback, while that's impossible uh, for a teacher to immediately grade everything that the students submit right away. I think that um, establishing an expectation of grading early on is a, is a, is a, goes a long way into uh, helping build that engagement with students is that if they know that it's going to take you two to three days to grade, then that's something they can bank on, they can rely on, and it gives them that consistency uh, of experience in the class. I think 
uh, also having the discussions, uh, discussion forums, uh, in face to face, you have the synchronicity and online, you're mostly in the asynchronous environment, but responding quickly. Like I said, uh, having a policy stated early on that you'll be in, uh, you know, every, you know, within a 24 hour period responding, uh, is something that, again, once you, once you establish consistency, um, students have that platform and that flame, framework to work off of and they can build off everything else so I think that's probably the number one component there is is consistency of environment excellent thank you both um, I was just thinking when Chris pulled up that spider solitaire um, instead of a yellow smiley face kind of creepy guy emoticon I think I should have a dinosaur playing spider solitaire That'd be very funny. Okay, so here was our last question. And so if we go to the last slide here, um, what I thought is funny, because I thought all of that that we just did would take about five minutes, and we could spend the rest of the time on this one. <laughs> but it's been almost two hours, and so I'm wondering if maybe this last uh, discussion question topic should go uh, for later in the week. But here's something to think about during this week um, in the MOOC. How would you evaluate this MOOC, pretending that uh, we had to do that? And actually, Kay does have to do it because of the, of the grant. Um, but now that you have sort of a framework for some different kinds of questions and different ways to collect data, uh, what different types of questions would you ask about the learning that happened in this MOOC? Um, and then how would you collect data to help answer each of the questions that you thought of to evaluate the MOOC. So do you guys want to have that conversation or should we have that online in the MOOC or do you want to have that later, like <laughs> Thursday? I, I, th I think we can include it later. <laughs> okay. But I, I did put up the discussion question. Um, about how you would, and and while you, your question was a little more general, um, mine might be, and, but I think we need the general too. But um, mine also, and I have it up here on the screen, and 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 yes, some gamers will will get the well, why I picked that picture. <laughs> so, so so we'll see who gets that. But anyway, um, when it comes to, especially when it comes to our MOOC. You know, what do we want to look at? Because here's the deal. Um, our MOOC has been a bit different than some of the other um, massively open online courses. And how, how do we evaluate it? Because we've done a lot of synchronous and not just asynchronous. Um, we've had gameplay. We've had live stream of gameplay. Um, we, also, we also have novice and expert in our group. And and also in the discussion forum that this is that this is on, um, I, I put up some some people who have been blogging about MOOCs in general, and and where do we fit in? <laughs> and and Chris Sager, the person who won our curator award, who did a phenomenal job of curation. I mean, he even put in one of the discussions a couple weeks back, going, "Well, maybe we're a different kind of MOOC. Maybe we're a G MOOC, a game MOOC, or a gamified MOOC. And maybe you know, maybe that's what makes us different." So, so yeah, when it comes to the evaluation questions, and I think this works for any kind of gaming experience you have, have your students do that, that you might leave it a bit open ended. I like that. Thank you for uh, putting those questions up there on the MOOC. How about you, Chris? Any last words? No, I think, like I said, I mean, it'll be interesting to see um, how everyone talks about the MOOC. I'd like to see this as a discussion in the uh, in the MOOC itself because it'd be uh, it'd be interesting to get everyone's feedback. It's been uh, I've had a lot of fun uh, participating in the MOOC and uh, lurking and creating and helping out in different aspects. So. Um, you know, really, it'll be interesting to see what sort of data uh, can look at. I mean, I think eventually we'll probably look at some of the uh, qualitative assessment methodologies that are out there on, on, the, on the archive website to sort of look at growth uh, and progression throughout the course of the MOOC. So, uh, can't wait. Well, I want to thank um, everybody who's uh, participated in contributing in the MOOC itself. I've, I've learned a lot, even though I've just been a lurker. But um, I've also learned a lot today in our discussion with you, um, Chris and Kay. And I want to thank you guys for helping this old dinosaur learn a little bit about games. So thank you. OK.
Okay, thanks everybody. So we're going to end broadcast now, and we'll see you guys online. Bye.